decided to go to America to do what? Well, um, when I had done the Poseidon yeah. Adventure with yeah. you, I was um, I had done television drama before that, which was um, killing my soul. It was really starting to destroy me. The monotony of it, there was not no love in it for me. It became a little bit like a sausage factory. So uh, it, it started to dis destroying me a little bit. So I thought, you know, it's, um, it's not, I'm not meant for it. So I'd quit that and then I had a very dry period for a long time when I started freelancing and I found it very, very hard. It was a very difficult time and it was very difficult on the on the ego, you know, and asking questions about what you're going to do for the rest of your life, etc, etc. And then do I, I remember you split up with your boyfriend at the time or were you when, just about sort of... When I left for America, yeah, okay. I split up then, yeah. Right, no, no. Um, but, um, at the time, I got presented this incredible opportunity to do the Poseidon Adventure with you, which was a, like a huge part for me, an incredible opportunity, um, working with an international director and international cast, and I was privileged to have a nice part, so I spent a lot of time with people, and it was a very pleasant production, you know, I really enjoyed it, and I got to know some incredible people, and it's there when I first realized that it's less about what you do, it's more about the relationships that you forge with people, that really, you know, those are the things that you really remember, you know, and they really reverberate through the rest of your life. Anyway, during this experience, many of the actors that I've been working with said to me, you know, you would do great overseas. And I was 22 at the time, and I thought, wow, that's a wonderful opportunity. You know, maybe I should, I'm, I'm young, I've got, I've just made a certain amount of money, and, you know, if there's, if there's a chance and opportunity, you should take it. And since I would know these, some of these people when I get to America, I thought, wonderful. You know, but I had... <laughs> no idea what it really entailed or what it was necessary for me to do or what whatnot. So I finished the job and immediately started looking into applying. I thought I would apply for a visitor's visa and I would go and see what happens. I didn't have the money to apply for a green card through a lawyer, etc., etc., etc. That's that was not the, the journey destined for me. Um, so I thought I'm going to get my, my visitor's visa, I'll go over there, I'll meet with people and see and see what, what opportunities are presented to me. So I was given a, a three-month multiple entry visa and I, in my ignorance, also didn't really understand what that meant. Um, I thought that I, I had three months to enter the country, which is which is what I did. So I um, like three three times in and out. Or no, I I thought that I had three months to go to America. Right. Because they, you know, you know how it is with the American embassy. You go for your interview, and they can either give you a ten-year multiple entry visa, which they did for for um, another friend of mine. And, people who travel, etc., etc., or, you know, they looked at my profile and they saw that I was a young actress and they said, well, you know, three months. So I thought, well, if three months is all that I'm being given, then I will make it count. I went into America with everything that I had and I thought, that's it, I'm going to go and throw myself at the world and, you know, follow my dream and yeah. see what will happen, etc., etc. I got to America and they gave me an I-94 or an I-96, which they put in the passport and they said, okay, great, you landed now and you can stay for six months. So I thought, fantastic, if I can stay for six months, then I'm going to stay for six months. I'm being given, like, you know, some, some extra time. Um, I had very, very little money, but it was very, it was, I had an incredibly fortuitous time in America. I met wonderful people, I met up with many of the people, including yourself, um, who I had known here and met in South Africa, and some of them were incredibly helpful, and some of them turned out to be completely empty, and um, offered to help me when I arrived, their, their help was more damaging really than anything else. And did you, did you get a job so you could sort of... Well, because I didn't have a working permit, it was illegal for me no, to work. So no, I wasn't no, but like, you know, to keep yourself alive. But what happened is I'm through friends who took pictures of me and I ended up, what I ended up doing is house-sitting for people. And it worked in the most incredible way because I would house, house I got to know all of Los Angeles that way because I was everywhere. I would house it in North Hollywood for two weeks and as my time they would come to an end, somebody else would say in West Hollywood, look, I need somebody to look after my place. And it was just really incredible how that held out for me. I, I lived that way for about three months and then I couldn't do it anymore. It was exhausting having to pack up my life constantly and move every two weeks. I couldn't do it anymore. So then I started renting a room um, in a house with three girls and three boys in, um, in, in Fairfax, just off Fairfax Avenue, yeah. And it was wonderful. It was three very good months. Um, it was nice to settle and to own the city in my own right. And I think if you live in a place, then you get to know it on your own terms, and that's really valuable. 
But I ended up meeting somebody who needed somebody to babysit for them. And I would babysit for them and they paid me a couple of bucks an hour and I grew very, very close to the little boy. He was three months when I arrived and he was eight months when I left. I saw how he started to walk and everything and I get along very well with children. So that was incredible because I could get very, very far on my babysitting money. But I didn't have a working permit, which meant that I couldn't do any film. So what I did is I went for, I, I got a manager through somebody that I'd met here in, in Cape Town, oh, uh, Adam Baldwin, yeah. and he introduced me to his manager. And um, he was sending me on many auditions and castings, and I went to, got started meeting people. And of course, the working permit thing was a great issue. So what I had done is I had eradicated my South African accent completely. I refused to change my name, I wouldn't change my name, but I eradicated my accent completely so that I, when I walked into a room I could sell people the idea that I can, I can play the part. They so people tried to get me to change my name and I just said, but it's just too much about where I'm from and, and whatnot, so I said no. But my, the plan was that before they look down at my CV and see what my name is and see that I'm foreign, I would already sell myself as being capable to do the job. And it worked very, very well. I also found that in America, if you can sell them your story, then you, you already got to, if you can say, listen, I'm from South Africa, I sold everything I had, I came here on a whim, I, I, I came to follow my dream, and they love that stuff, you know, that's wonderful, yes, we're on your side, you know, and that's how I thought I'm going to do it, you know, I'm going to get somebody to invest enough in me to feel that they are going to provide me with a working permit on their behalf, they'll, they'll apply for me, that was the only way I could see it doing, and so far it looked like it was going to be a very good plan. Then I met an in independent, um, through, through a, an actor, I met um, a director of an independent film company and they do a lot of films, yeah. non-union stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And um, they said, well, listen, you don't have a working permit. Well, non-union is, is the stuff where you can, where so you, you can. You can kind of get you away can, with it, you know? Yeah, you're right. So they said, listen, we'll pay you under the table. You're not taking the work away from, from an, another American citizen. Just come and be in our movie, you know? It won't be, re it won't be legal work, so it's fine. It was a terrible film. I was um, nude in the movie as well, but I thought, oh hell, you know, it's my body. I'm young. So were you were you driving? Me? Were you driving around? Oh yes, I got. You have to drive I got my to my car license yes. five months before. Okay, really? so I was still very fresh, and we drive on the other side of the road here. So it was a huge thing for me. And, I got and, a rental car. And insurance. I do, uh, because once again, the first person that I aligned with when I got to uh, to America, who actually just gave me so much bad advice, I should never have listened to it. I am somebody who always trusts my gut, and this, everything that she told me went against my gut. And I should have actually just bought myself a, like a wreck and gone in with that. You know? But anyway, so I rented a car, which was quite expensive, but it had insurance covering it. And um, I had three car accidents while I was there, <laughs> of which only one was my fault. The other two were not my fault. And then what did you do? So you were okay. Uh, but I was fine. I got around. Because most people don't have an insurance. In no, LA. no, no. I got, I got 50 insurance. Fifty percent of them drive around without insurance. Yeah, I know. So I, would, yeah. I took, took great care to do yeah. the right thing, etc., etc. So I did this film. Uh, it was like five minutes at the very end of the beginning of the movie, and five minutes at the end. It was once again, it was a poor film. Yeah. Great people didn't yeah. take themselves too seriously. I always feel, you know, a great problem that we often encounter in our job is people who take themselves too seriously. As far as I'm concerned, we should take what we do very seriously, but you should never take yourself too seriously. So it was great work with these people. Terrible movie though. <laughs> but that's not the point. So I did this film and still, and I started feeling unhappy with my manager. I felt like it wasn't the right manager for me. Just because it was offered to me doesn't mean it's the right one. And as serendipity would have it, I met somebody else who I was being friendly with and once we were dr I was driving and I almost ran this gentleman over and he ended up knowing the gentleman was in the car with me and they started chatting and he said, well, you're a pretty lady, you know, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I've come to seek my fortune in America. And he said, well, I'm a manager, come and see me. And I said, well, I do have a manager at the moment. He said, well, come and see me anyway. And my gut felt right with this man. So I left the other gentleman who was very upset with me, but I felt it's my choice, you know. I'm, I'm I can't feel like I'm being crunched. I've only got this one opportunity. I'm going to make it stick. And, and this manager was very good to me. He was a good friend to me. He introduced me to lots of different people. He got me an agent. I signed on to the same agent that you were with. Um, APA. APA okay. I signed with APA, with Tyler there. And I was very excited. And 
I started doing more and more castings every day, I was thrilled because the, whereas in South Africa you cast with four or five casting directors, in America every time you go for a casting, it's for something completely different with a completely different human. It's a great opportunity to, to broaden your scope. And I was incredibly fortunate, I got callbacks for pretty much everything, I tested for four series, I signed four preliminary contracts, it happened four times that I ended up being the last three people standing, it made me feel incredibly proud. And then finally, um, I was basically confirmed on a series, and this is now after f five months. Um, I finally signed on to, well, the preliminary, pre 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 preliminary sign on to this project um, for a small network. It was a, it was about a family and it would a, a CIA family that tra tracked down whatever, whatever you know how those things are, and they would shoot in Toronto and New York and. Um, also somewhere else in Canada as well, Vancouver, I believe. And I thought, wonderful, these people are sold, they said good, they're prepared to start going through the process of applying for my working permit, and I thought, fantastic, it's all going to happen, it's all finally happening. And I finally had time to deal with the personal side of my visit to America as well, because my father had immigrated to Canada about five years previously. I hadn't been able to go and see him, um, I'd lost contact with him to a great degree, and I'd been in America for about five months now, and he was just across the border, and it surely it should be possible for me to go and see him now. My mother wasn't sick at this time, no, no, it was, a, it was, a, it was, it was following, following that. So I thought, great, I've got my work is all lined up, it's ready to go, it's, it's all good. Um, I flew to Canada because I thought I've got a multiple entry visa, it's all good. Um, exited, everything was fine with my passport and I got two immigration lawyers explaining my papers to me and they said, no, it's all good, it's all good and I thought everything was, was fine. And then I went to Canada and after four days of being in Canada, um, my agent phoned me and they said, you've been confirmed, we need you to come back for a script read-through on the 4th of July, Independence Day, auspicious day, and come for a script read-through on the Wednesday. And I was thrilled. How long had you not seen your father? Five years. So I was, and we had been planning a road trip up through Canada. So we were already on our fourth day of the road trip, and he said, "Well, what we'll do is we'll drop you off in Calgary, and then my brother, my brother, and himself would go up to Athabasca to see the glacier." So they dropped me off at Calgary. I flew to Vancouver to cross through the border. My father left, lost cell phone reception, so I couldn't call him anymore. And. Um, and I boarded my plane to Vancouver, and I was about to change flights when a gentleman checked my passport and picked me out of the line. And all I had with me, and look, look I had literally given up everything in South Africa, took all the possessions I had to America, I'd rented a room, you were kind enough to provide me with a blow-up mattress. My computer, my books, and everything. I bought myself little things from Bed Bath and Beyond that I had you know, put together and had a whole room there. And all I had when I went to see my father was a backpack with two changes of clothing and my toothbrush and some cream, I believe. And they pulled me out of the line and they say, how long have you been in this country? I said, well, about five months. He said, and um, what do you do? I said, well, I'm an actress. He said, come with us and just sit here. And I started, was starting to get anxious because I had to board my next plane. And they just kept me there and they kept me there and I was starting to get slightly hysterical. And then they Googled me, and then they saw that I had done a production with the American production company, and they said, well, you know, what is this? And I said, well, it's, it's not a non-union job, it's not, it's, it's, you know, it wasn't a real thing. And they said, you know what? We suspect you of being an illegal alien, and we're not going to allow you back into the country. And I remember thinking that surely this is not possible, because right up into that time, everything had just been going right. Everything had just been happening like clock. Things had just been going right. It was incredible. I, I thought I was obviously doing the right thing, because all the right things were happening. And then they said, you can't go back to the country. I couldn't get hold of my father. I, they didn't know what I was doing in Canada. I, and I was trying to explain. I just came to visit my dad. I couldn't get hold of him, so they wouldn't believe me. They said, well, you obviously don't have a family member in Canada. And... Uh, and then they said, okay, well, just wait for us. And they made me wait there until I missed my plane. And then they took my fingerprints and they blacklisted me and revoked my visa. And they, 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 they had, because I said to them, I've got a return ticket to South Africa for the 18th of July because I had my return ticket, but I didn't travel with it because, like a fool, I thought it would be dangerous to travel with important papers. I should leave them at home. 
and they wanted to see a copy of the ticket. I said, I don't have a copy of the ticket, of, um, but it's on American Airlines database. And they sent me out into the terminal to look for American Airlines, but they're not being an American Airlines terminal uh, uh, office ticket office in the terminal. So they made me waste so much time. It was, it, I really felt like I was being fucked with. Yeah. Anyway. Right. So I walk out into Vancouver airport with nowhere to go. I can't contact my father. I don't know anybody. And I run into my stepbrother. Who, his mother, my stepfather's ex-wife, had immigrated to Canada 10 years before. And she um, lived in North Vancouver and he had come to visit her. And he had just dropped his cousin off at the airport. And we ran into each other at the airport. I went home with him and I stayed, ended up staying with my stepfather's ex-wife in North Vancouver for a month, which is an adventure on its own. I b rented a bicycle every day and rode, took the ferry across and rode around Stanley Park and I appealed to the uh, South African Consulate General and um, he did his absolute best to intercede on my behalf, but at the visa office they just said, we don't, we don't trust any of this. Yeah, it's ours. Do you I'll, I'll get it. I need this table if you're not Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's your paper. No, that was on the table. Thank you. That's pretty. Pretty. Um, anyway, so they just said they maintain that, um, because my still, we still couldn't get hold of my father, they maintain that they feel that the story about my father was uh, made up and that my intention was to remain in the U.S. illegally, which was not my intention. My utmost intention was to be as legal as humanly possible, otherwise I couldn't do my job. But anyway, I understand the nature of these things, etc., etc., of these things, and, um, and that was it. And I was angry, very angry at myself. I was angry with God. I was, and I'm not even I'm not right. even a religious human, yeah. but I needed to be angry at yeah. someone. I was angry at America. I was angry with everybody. I couldn't understand. For a whole month, I tried to, you know, do my best. And still, with a production company that had decided to sign me on, I still went to go and see. They flew up to Canada to go and see me at Lionsgate Studios, audition for them again. And we thought maybe because most of my scenes will be shot in Canada, maybe I could just remain and, and stay. But the catch-22 is in order to apply for a Canadian working permit, I have to leave and go into the US and apply from there or apply from South Africa, which was impossible for me to do. And finally they just phoned and said, we're very sorry, but it's much simpler to just get an American girl to play for that. And then I realized it was not going to happen and I was devastated. I came back to South Africa with nothing, nothing. That little backpack yeah, was all yeah, I had. I had to yeah. abandon everything I had in, yeah. in Los Angeles. Um, I was embarrassed and I felt like such a failure. And I came back to South Africa and for about two weeks I slept on my best mate's floor in Johannesburg. It was winter time. Our municipality was on strike. And it was cold and dusty and brown and there was trash everywhere. And so depressed, I just thought, oh, and I still had my American accent. I kind of refused to let go of it because it was like the last shred of a dream that I thought was going to come true. And, um, and then I came to Stellenbosch to visit my parents, who I hadn't seen in a very long time. And a friend of mine was doing an audition for a play, and I said, I also want to audition for the play. I went and I rekindled the relationship with my old agent, and I, I got the part in the play. And I ended up never leaving, and I'm still here, uh, seven, eight years later, and I'm so, so happy that I'm here, because I found a fulfillment here that I think I never would have found over there, because I was not only incredibly lonely there, I also realized that the work that you do there is a different kind of work, and um, at that point in my life I thought I'd finished with theatre, you know, I'm not never going to do theatre again, and I rediscovered a, a passion for theatre that I, I cannot even explain to somebody and it makes me so happy, I, fair enough, I don't, I don't earn as much as I would have or used to when I did more television, but, but it's, 
it's so much more rewarding and it's it's really wonderful having a an active participating audience that you can exchange with all the time and getting to know people and then that brings me back to the first part of my story where we spoke about the relationships that you share with people and how important those relationships are now thinking back on my American experience it's the relationships that I had smelled it with people there that I still have today that's the precious thing of ex that experience and I also realize that this is where I was meant to be you know, you, everything a friend of mine always says everything flows air flows water flows the earth flows in its own magical way and it's all about flowing you just have to carry on flowing but it's funny you know it's like in a very small way it's it's like you've gone you've gone Hollywood because people blew smoke with your eyes yeah and it's such a and I believed a, it you know yeah and it's, it is so uh, what's the word it's, it's hard to resist. It is hard to resist. It's you know, you know? it's it's, a, yeah. it's ego as well. You know, it's a great yeah, amount yeah. of of that. But what I but did your mother bring you home, or did you find that she? I mean, once you were back. Well, that is was that, the wonderful thing. Is if I had stayed there. You, you know, the thing about the personal ties that tie you. I mean, uh, our mothers and fathers are part of it. And, and you see, up to you that. You were there now to be able to take care of her. Well, she exactly. And that's the thing. Is up to that point, I had a very, I had um, had a very strained relationship with my mother. You know, I had gone through like being a young person and independent, yeah. independence and etc. etc. And really untied my tethers from from my, my my family in that sense. And I'm an only child as well. You know. And on returning back and having to go back and live with my parents it took some humility. You know, I had to like say to my parents, listen, I don't have any money, please can I move back into your house? And I rediscovered them as adults. And with what did they a say when you came back? They were so happy to have me. Oh. It was the most wonderful thing. It was my mother was so grateful to have us time with and I lived with them for a year and I you know I I looked after them etc etc and then my mother became ill and I thought to myself what a privilege it is to be close enough to her to be able to be there for her during her illness because my father's mother also had cancer passed away at the beginning of the year and him being in Canada couldn't be here for her illness he couldn't be here for her funeral and it's a sacrifice that we make as actors you know we, I can't tell you how many funerals and weddings and birthdays I've missed because you know you make a choice between your career and your personal life and your career and your personal life and what and suddenly I realized what I needed was to be close to my mother and put everything in perspective you know, the problem that we face and mortality and once again the relationships that you have with people and how that makes you richer and how that gives you so much more to draw on as a, as a performer and, and I realize that the opportunities that I have here are just as valuable if not more valuable than the opportunities that I were offered overseas even though they were more no you don't see them there's so much more opportunities there's nothing here Think, we think that the opportunities here are less significant because we're a smaller country or our industry is not as vast, but, but you face exactly the same problems there, just in an alien environment, you know. And it depends on whether that's the challenge that you're looking for or not. At the time, when I was doing it, that was the challenge that I had seeked in my life. Well, what about the sense of humor? Because we know that's part of our lives. And, and the, the, one of the things, you know, that gets lost in translation... <coughs> Many times, you know. It's your sense of humor. Yeah. You know, I find that people don't often, and being misunderstood when I was overseas, vastly and massively misunderstood, whether it's a cultural thing yeah, or a what. Yeah, sure, sure. But um, people's understanding of irony or dark humor or being sadistic, and not in a, in a destructive way, but in a fun, wonderful way. My mother always says, oh no, my, my beautiful ex-minister, stepfather, always says, a dirty mind is a joy forever. And then people can't enjoy it. Did your mother give it to you? No, my stepfather. Yeah, my stepfather father. used to be a, a, right. a minister. Right, I see. I see. And you know, if you can't embrace those things, then what joy is there in life? Life is uh, so much more balanced than. than Can yeah. you say something about boyfriends at all? Because do they play a role in this at all or not? Well, because, I mean, you know. Let me put it this they way. They are part of the They're ties. very much a part of it. Yeah. And I, I guess, I'm to a certain degree, you know, I'm, I'm a fiercely independent human being. No, no. But I'm also very much aware of my own um, shortcomings. Well, I found yeah, before I, I went say, to. You're not a woman. 
you know, you're not a woman as long as there's a man somewhere. You know. Exactly, and there always will be. But um, I found before I went to America, before I started doing the Poseidon Adventure, I was really starting to lose myself in the relationship because I couldn't validate myself anymore because I wasn't working. And I, my partner at the time couldn't understand it. He could only see the monetary side of the situation. And because of the financial problem, the financial situation I was in, I was kind of stuck in that relationship because I couldn't claim my own independence because I wasn't financially independent. But slowly I reclaimed that when I started working again, etc, etc, etc. But finally, my escape to America was also an escape from that relationship. It was the only way I could see myself freeing myself from it. And I did. Just threw off the bonds well, you know, and we ran. Need, so we need something, and he was yeah. very much hurt by it, but yeah. I think he also deserved it. You know, that relationship had also come to an, its own auspicious yeah, end. No, 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 no. And then in America, you know, I met a gentleman or two. That were, I found that many of the personalities that I met in America... I not, this is not to be said for all no, Americans. No, I know not, many no. wonderful, wonderful yeah. people. Yeah. But I had many people um, who were... I had a socialist friend. I had a libertarian friend. I had an activist friend. I had a fundamentalist. And they were all very much in their own boxes. And they, and they all came from different ends of the spectrum. And so, you know, I got to know some gentlemen in, in there as well, uh, in, in America as well. What, what period was, uh, was the film with Butch? Where was that? Was that in the beginning? Um, oh, the, the Mojave yeah, phone booth. Yeah. Oh, that was a, yeah, I actually completely forgot to yeah, mention that, yeah. but that was Patch's own independent film yeah, yeah. that we shot in Las Vegas. Yeah. It was in the middle, yeah, okay. it was in, in, in April. We shot for in Las Vegas for two in weeks. in the house already, in the house. Yeah, yeah. and it, it was, um, it was a fine time. It was yeah. also a very fine project to be part of. Yeah. Also, many of the people that I'd worked with in South Africa were there. It's always very interesting seeing people working away from home and then meeting them in their home environment. They're often completely different yeah. people and yeah. I'd never encountered that before. Yeah. I should have expected it really, but I'd never, I'd never, I'd never, you know, encountered that before. I guess what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, that kind of, that kind of philosophy, you know. But, okay. um, but yeah, it was wonderful and, and John Patch really looked after me so, yeah. so well. He's a really wonderful human being. But the sad thing is that because for such a long time I was so embarrassed about my so-called failure, of succeeding yeah. in America, which now in retrospect I realize was yeah. not, you know, it was just the way the right. cookie crumbled. Yeah. Um, I don't remember what I want to say. It's crystal clear. No, but the story is crystal clear. You know, it's, uh, Yes, it was. But, uh, but, but, the, but the sad thing is, I lost. I lost contact with a lot of those people. Who, a lot of people who had been very good to me as well, because I felt like I disappointed them, and there was nothing worse for me than feeling like I. Had yeah, well, shame is somebody, stupid. You know? yeah. It is. It is. It's a it's, terrible thing. Yeah. Tennessee Williams says that guilt is one of the greatest human emotions. It's one of the greatest human motivators, and that's such a sad thing. Guilt should never be your motivator. What a terrible no, but thing. it works. It works so well. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm very glad now that I'm yeah. slightly older. And, yeah. you know, yeah. more, and happy, and yeah. I think that's what it basically boils down to: is being happy with well, what so, you're doing. And you, what did you no, do? You started a company. I started a theatre yeah. company because we were frustrated and drunk and saying, yeah. "Ah, you know, yeah. the stink, the state of theatre." And you know, you come to a point where you realise the only way you're going to be satisfied and change things is if you do it yourself. You know, I'm not in a position where I want to write my own material yet. I don't want to direct myself. But we found a group of like-minded, passionate people who want to come together in spite of ego and just create something because they care about it so much. And it's and it's welcomed. You know, people are hungry for that, and and it's inspired me and it excites me and. Um, it makes me so happy, and it gives me purpose. It gives me purpose, you know. And then you like you liken that 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 purpose that you found in your life to, for instance, my mother's illness and and you know her mortality and those kind of questions, and then it brings it into a whole new beautiful light, you know. Yeah. And did you? And when you found your mother, let's say, I mean, it, uh, it's it's such a stupid question because my because I, I think I knew the answer, but you were coming home with a disappointment and. 
and you thinking that your mother is going to be disappointed in a way. No, <laughs> she was so home. grateful that no, I came course, home. I think, I think yeah. there's a, of course, every mother wants her child to succeed, but I think there's also a part of a mother, especially if you're an only child, you know, yeah, that thinks, leave. that feels that, you know, the closer you are to me, the better. Yeah. My mother always used to say that we have um, an elastic bond between us, and regardless of how far we travel from each other, that bond will always bring us back together, yeah. you know, and it's unbreakable. Yeah. No, but and you, that's you, the wonderful you, thing. You said before that you were a little bit let's say removed from her yeah and I guess you know you coming home brought you together again. that's the loss I mean, of the prodigal daughter you know yeah, yeah, it was exactly yeah, that and yeah. and being completely destitute as well and you know yeah. and being welcomed home with open arms my mother yeah. has always been my greatest inspiration and my greatest support she has always made me believe that I can do anything I put my mind to which is why I went to America in the first place and why there was no shame in coming home because you know you know I'm not not everyone is that fortunate but I always knew that my mother would be there to support me great thank you very much